I'll be I'll be ready shortly. Just waiting for some uh, more people to pop in. We're going to do some Q and A. I'm going to tell you where I've been. And um, yeah, we'll just uh, wait for a few people to come on in.
Hello right there. I am here. I'm just waiting for some people to pop in. Uh, I'm glad you're here on Facebook. Um, let me know. Let me know if you've been here before or where you're from, and I'll um, try and tailor what we do today a bit to your location. And we'll be doing some um, Q and A, and I've got a few quick suggestions about insects, bringing insects into the garden. So just hang on. We've only got. I'm just going to wait a few more minutes because I was a bit late and I've been away for for a few weeks so people have probably forgotten about me. Anyway, do pop in the comments where you're listening from and I'll see if I can so see if I can make the discussion a bit more relevant. They're better. That that's great. Um, Quality go. Uh, give us an idea of where that is, and I'll look it up uh, before we actually get properly started. Nice to see you. Uh, thanks here, Arissa Folia or Erica Folia, a ripper. Good one. Be with you shortly. It's taking a long time for the music to start. Let's try another one.
G'day, bird nerds. Oh, look, I'm out of focus again. Terrible stuff. Terrible stuff. Uh, let me uh, let me let me see if that can be easily remedied. Uh, probably going to focus on my forehand now. Oh, that looks a little bit better. All right, hello, bird nerds, um, plant nerds, nature nerds. I'm Grant. This is uh, Habitat Gardening. Um, now, if you're first time here, you probably need to know that it's really hard to do gardening stuff while you're sitting in a chair, uh, not outside. So what I'll try and do is just introduce the theme and then do a bit of Q&A and see where that takes us. Um, hello to new people. Hello to old people. Um, I've been I've been sick for a few weeks, so I haven't done anything. So I haven't publicised anything. I haven't even been doing first seen and heard, so I'm really sorry if you've almost forgotten who who I am. But here we go. Uh, introduction to, by the way, I'm a horticulturist as well as being a very avid bird nerd, and my main interest has been uh, Australian native plants, irrigation, and um, bird attracting and drought tolerant gardens. And I got more interested when I was working in. Uh, in retail horticulture and irrigation uh, with fire safety, gardens and fire safety. So they're my special subject areas. So if you've got any questions uh, on any of those, pop them in. Pop them in the comments. If you haven't been on a live stream, you can just, if you're on Facebook, YouTube uh, and Twitch, you can just pop a comment in a question and we'll get to uh, we'll attend to it as best we can. Now, today I want to talk mostly about something that gets forgotten a lot in uh, in gardening uh, and garden design. It's a little become a little bit popular with people understanding the plight of bees and pollinators, uh, and people are trying to attract bees into their garden. I want to take it a little bit further because. Um, bees are great, but when you see the honeybee, that's an introduced species here and uh, probably not a major food source of many birds. But it's the smaller insects that I'd like to see getting into people's gardens and that certainly in the urban areas where I spend most of my time these days, they're the plants that get really missed out in most garden design and there's a, there's a real bias towards small plants that have showy foliage uh, sorry showy flowers and I'm thinking particularly the uh, amazing popularity and the abundance of improved varieties available for things like kangaroo paws and they're great kangaroo paws are great for bringing birds into your garden but they're evolved in such a way that the uh, the main insects that use them are not the little tiny ones that lots of small birds can feed on so what I want to talk about today is just what to look for what to think about when you uh, wanting to, to bring new plants into that very bottom layer in your garden. So where we'd be usually talking about ground covers and those really small shrubs that often, you know, that it's been so popular using things like box hedges. Um, you're going to see... Uh, Azaleas are often in this um, size range and in more traditional gardens and uh, let's see let me let me say hello to um, to Betty too by the way hello Betty who has already uh, given us a comment I'll pop that up for people to have a look at Betty's coming from Quelligo uh, 131 acres so that is that's a fantastic space to work with um, and looking to bring in more birds. Imagine getting a, a flock of 100 yellow-tailed black cockatoos uh, coming in. 
Now, what I would like to ask you, um, Betty, you mentioned that they were feeding on the Banksia erysifolia or ericifolia, as it's often talked about. Are, are they plants that you planted? Do you have any remnant vegetation on 131 acres? Be really interested in that. And do you have any waterways, any, um, even if they're intermittent creeks that only run when it's uh, uh, when it's flooding? Let it, let it, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and maybe you can share with us a little bit about what your um, what your efforts have been so far and what your garden consists of. Like 131 acres is massive. So are you running a farm, a farmlet? Um, do you have remnant vegetation on there? And yeah, let's sort of talk about that to start with. Um, what are your water sources? Because that's really important on such a big block of land. And for those who don't know, because I didn't know, uh, Qualigo is about 30 kilometres from Goulburn. So Goulburn is uh, is on the main thoroughfare between Melbourne and Sydney, but it's also basically the turn off to Canberra. So it's it's towards Sydney, but it's close to Canberra. Um, used to be really only grazing, uh, grazing country when I was a kid, but between then and now it's got a lot of vineyards and a lot of um uh wineries so a lot of day tourism in the area of course being close to canberra too it's always uh had people just what 40 minutes down the road 45 minutes right down the road a large population center uh anyway uh so let the uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna bring up now uh one of my favorite natives to think about when you are um here we go let's just let's just bring up now these are the kind of plants that you you can think about when you are looking to introduce plants that are popular with insects uh now there's Craspedia, this is the billy buttons. I'll just bring up a nursery page. Hopefully you can see it. Let me see if it's up here. Uh, no, it's not. Yes, here it is. Let me bring it up now. Um, okay, that'll do. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is what we would commonly call billy buttons in the, uh, uh, this is a, a, a an Instagram page of, which nursery am I looking at? Woodbridge Nursery, so I'm guessing Woodbridge is up in, uh, is it up in Queensland? I'm thinking it is. Um, now, it's not much of a, not much of a picture, is it? It's got the flowering heads. Now these are really popular with butterflies and and moths. Um, full sun, yeah, full sun. Moderate frost tolerance, medium drought tolerance. I'll tell you what I know. Th why I like the Craspedia so much. It flowers in winter, um, and it's also certainly in Melbourne is. Is really good for areas that get intermittently inundated. So if you get irregular flooding, uh, they're really great. But I, I, why it's a good thing, a, a good example of the kind of plants that are good for bringing in small insects is it's in the broad daisy family, the Asteraceae family, and it's got that flower head of really small, tightly packed flowers that butterflies and small native flies and moths love. So it's a terrific plant to consider. Um, but everything like that, even you, even dandelions, you know, people think dandelion weed, you've got to pull them out. But anything like that, the, the everlasting daisies, the, the paper daisies, the snow daisies, then you've got all of those plants that, that you will will have seen in classical um, 
herbaceous borders. And I'm interested, Betty, maybe you've got herbaceous borders, uh, really good climate for it uh, up near Goulburn. Uh, Rude Beckia's, uh, conospermums, things like that. Um, they're fantastic for bringing in, bringing in this insects. And I think one of the reasons where, look, I'm just prevaricating, but I think one of the reasons why we're seeing less of the small insects and insects generally, I, I, I guess, in uh, in urban areas, is that the herbaceous border has gone out of style in small holdings. Um, you'll still see them in large, uh, people lu lucky enough to have a really large lot where they have space for a lawn and a play area and barbecue area and some large garden beds and, and maybe a, bo a border plantings, and a veggie garden. But that's not the norm anymore in in, in cities and uh, or in towns too, I would guess. So we're really missing out on these kind of plants. So so I'm looking, always looking for smaller, uh, really small plants that can serve uh, uh, this kind of function. So uh, you'll always find the Craspedia in nurseries. It's really popular now. So uh, Billy Buttons is what, you, what you'd be looking for. It doesn't need to be this species, Craspedia glauca. There's a bunch of them, uh, very... Um, very widespread genus in Australia. Look for it. Um, now, Betty's put up another comment. So let's have a look at that. So Betty's got two huge dams. Got silver perch. Oh, that's interesting. I'm, um, I can't reach the book. I'm actually working on on a little aqua, aquaculture slash horticulture project at the moment. So that's interesting. So you've got silver perch in there. Uh, uh, your grandson caught one good stuff two kilos good stuff um, lots of gums so they're remnant gums uh, Banksia marginata um, got over 40 over 40 Banksia marginatas so Banksia marginata is probably a uh, local species, but I'm 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 wondering whether the Banksia erysifolia. I might just um, might just call that up on the other computer. Um, sorry, while I look away. I think that's probably um, probably found uh, in your area. Certainly in the in the Sydney region. Uh, let's go distribution. Um, certainly found down to the uh, Chavis Bay region. Let's have a look. Um, and I know that Jarvis Bay is sort of weekender for Canberra. Sort of people, isn't it? So let's have a look at the distribution. Um, may not have extended in uh, uh, quite so much. Okay. 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 So you've planted planted all of them. Um, that's terrific. Now I'm sure they're really really popular with uh, with the honey eaters. Tell me something. Um, uh, Betty, if you don't mind, have you have you been employing your planting mostly in like belts, like shelter belts? Because you're on 130 acres, you've got two big dams. I'm guessing, um, are you running livestock as well, or have you been looking at creating little patches of habitat? Really interested in in, in how you've been going about that, and well, maybe you can um, uh, answer that. I'm going to bring up another uh, another genus, which I think are fantastic for bringing up insects. I'm going to go to one of my favourite... Um, oh, it doesn't have the picture, though, does it? 
or does it? Oh, yes, 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 yes. All right. Another great um, genus to um, uh, to look at is the Dampiera. And they got blue flowers. So if you're looking at blue, Dampiera and Scavola are terrific plants to, uh, uh, to think about. Now, they do have showy flowers. Let's get a couple up. Um, where's one that's really, really popular? Okay, this one. you'll find really easily available in nurseries. It's not a very good photo. Let's look at this one. This is a better photo. Uh, look at that. Named by Robert Brown. Is this going to show me the... No, it's not. Oh, sorry about that. That's not a very good... Uh, not a very good one i think we'll go back and find a better uh, a better picture of, of what they look like in in their habitat here we go this is much better um there we go that's a much better photo oh it's on angus stewart's uh pic angus stewart's uh photo as well so let's um I'm out of practice every time I get a bit crook and I'm out of practice. I'm very slow at getting these things up. All right. I must say, Angus Stewart's got a fantastic website too, by the way. Here it is, Gardening with Angus. Now, this is why Dampiera are great. Let's see if this photo comes up. There we go. There we go. We can see that, can we? Oh, what? Come on. <laughs> there we are. So Dampier are uh, a ground cover generally, but there are some varieties that are small, uh, very small shrubs um, and up, upright. Um, how do I click off that one? So there we go. You can see that's a very good dense mat forming shrub, uh, ground cover, beg your pardon. That's a ripper. Um, yeah. None of these websites are great with having links to other places, are they? Let's have another another shot at another shot. There we are. So you can see the Dampier, Dampier if you're familiar with um, uh, with many of the native plants, the Dampier and the Scavola look very, very similar. And a good opportunity to introduce blue. So it doesn't have to be a lavender, folks. You don't have to have a lavender. If you want to bring in blue or purple, you can get a dampier in there. Um, now, some of the other things, I'll just remove that one. I'll set up another um, uh, another one here. Uh, stop sharing. Keep uh, commenting or ask, asking questions. This is the problem with... Uh, with doing like a gardening presentation when you're not actually gardening. Um, I'm going to show you another one which you may not uh, know about. Um, oh, let's go with one. You'll no, you'll no doubt be able to see this one in local nurseries up there. Um Now this is a super common plant in um, I'm only bringing it up as a, as a uh, as an example because there are lots and lots of plants that are like this sorry wouldn't it be great to have a producer wouldn't it be great to have a uh, Share screen. Okay, it's easier. Now, can we 
you see this up in up in here now? No, here we go in a second. Okay, Divisia. Now there's lots and lots of pea-shaped flowers. You can see that typical pea flower. Uh, lots of different genus, but they they have a flower that most um, it's it's not it's not a bird attracting flower, and you can have um, the classic egg and bacon, which is what the Divisia latifolia is. But there there are so many kinds of pea shaped flowers out there, and the smaller ones are not really bird attracting, but they are butterfly, beetle, and native fly attracting. So find find them and use them. Um, they are really, really, really easy to find. You'll find uh, hovias, they're generally in a blue, uh, the blue flower range. There's um, gonfalobium, there's these divisias, there are canettias, although the canettias are, are, are very good for bird attracting as well. They're often quite rampant. Um, glycines, they're they're really, really uh, commonly available and they're light creepers in form generally, but they have the pea-shaped flower and insects, moths, butterflies uh, and the small native flies really love them. Um, and these are all things that are really important for the insectivorous birds to be feeding on and also small possums and uh if you've got antichinus, you know, the uh, little marsupials, little insectivorous, carnivorous uh, marsupials, they need all of these things to be able to um, live well in your garden. Um, Betty, you've, you've mentioned you've got, a, you've got eucalypts and, and we've talked about banksias that you've been uh, planting. Do you first question? Let's go back to let's go back to first principles. Did you start with a design and a plan, or have you uh, have you developed your plantings the way I think most of us tend to do? Is you um, uh, you're just living your life and you start planting a bit around the house, and then you want to veg your garden, and then you decide you need a windbreak and you put in a windbreak and it's all quite hodgepodge or have you um you know have have you actually come up with a master plan for planting have you thought about those wildlife corridors linking to neighboring uh properties or to areas that might have more remnant bush maybe you've got roadsides which have a lot of vegetation in them and and have you thought about that framework that overall landscape framework linking to um to other areas uh or have you made your um your property uh, to be sort of a place where wildlife live rather than wildlife use oh here's a nice long comment thanks for this betty let's let's go through this you got no livestock well that's that's terrific you got wombats, wallabies, kangaroos, excellent. Echidnas, excellent. Blue tongues, now that's a good indicator that there's plenty of uh, feet around, living, they're living under the house. Uh, good, you're leaving the logs on the ground. That's great. The, most people will will, lift, will remove fallen timber, often just as fuel for, for the pot belly stove or the open fire. No, that's great. So leave, leave that in. That's really good. Um, you picked up all the rocks. So you can slash the rocks. Okay. Uh, so you're bringing, getting wildflowers as a result of the slashing. Okay, that's good. That's good management. Um, are you using the rocks somewhere else? That's good. Uh, the kangaroos stay around. You got... Okay. By doing the slashing, that, of course, promotes... Fresh growth, so yeah, kangaroos do like fresh growth and new shoots. That's why, that's why um, 
cultural burning practices are good. Slashing um, really uh, imitates that, so that's good. Um, uh, uh, okay, so I'm guessing you're continuing on. Uh, so the kangaroo is a resident. That's good. That's good to know. Uh, it's good that you're not trying to actively drive them away, as so many landowners do. Uh, they've found a good place, um, and hopefully their population is sort of in is in balance. Um, so they never leave. Uh, so I, I'm thinking you're going on to the next comment because you've got no design. You start. I reckon you started. Let's see where that goes. Um, I think most most people. I think I know certainly when I've when I've lived on on larger uh, larger holdings or had friends with larger holdings. Very rarely is there uh, does it begin with an overall plan for what the um, plantings might be. There's generally another idea first, like. Um, are you running cattle? Are you running sheep? Um, can you grow flowers or something? You know, a, a, a farm generally is an economic uh, asset that people need to turn into something that generates income. If you don't have to, that's extremely, extremely lucky. Um, maybe, maybe you can start uh, with with a bit of a nursery on uh, on such a large lot. You. It's great you got two dams, so you've probably got water, and you um, can probably do something in terms of being really uh, secure when it comes to fires in the region, and probably means you can supply, you can irrigate uh, anything that you need to water to get established. That you, so very, very, very fortunate. Um, maybe one day, Betty, you can post some photos and. Uh, maybe you can email them uh, to me, and we can maybe look at your uh, look at the development of your place. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just I'm just waiting to see if you're coming up with another um, uh, with another another comment. Um, now I, we looked at. Um, uh, I just brought up the Divisia before. I just want to go to another one which... Um, now, I'm going to a genus now because this often gets... Um, uh, where are we? Let's find a good... Let's find a good one. Let's go to the Native Plant Society. That'll be good. Okay, I think we've got this up. Right. Um, let me just see if we got it. All right, let's bring this up. Now, this is a genus that I think gets overlooked often, and you'll find lots of Melaleucas. That's what I'm talking about, Melaleucas. Come on in, come on in, Melaleucas. But you'll find lots of Melaleucas um in nurseries, but you'll often find the really big, showy melaleucas. Um, what I would like you to look for when we're talking about bringing in insects is the uh, the melaleucas that have smaller flowers, smaller bottle brush kind of flowers. Now. There's over 200 um, species, as this points out. But they fill every sort of niche. I'm just going to try and bring up a few of them. Here we go. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, here's a bunch. Here's a bunch. Um, you can see they're in all different flowers, flower types, but... Let's just scroll through. But you can see these little ones like with the smaller flowers like Melaleuca nasophila, which is this purple flowered one in the centre here, or next to it, Melaleuca nodosa, which is a yellow flower. They're, they're not so attractive to the large honey eaters and the parrots. And then you've got some which are very small, small pro profile plants like this Melaleuca wilsonii. Um, let's just have a look a little, little bit further. You've got spiky ones. You've got big trees like Melaleuca quinquinervia here, the big... Um, uh, but then you've got these little ones like Melaleuca scabra, Melaleuca suberosa. They've got small flowers, and that's where you're going to get the insects really, really enjoying them. So, um, apart from Q&A, I, I, I just really wanted to introduce the idea that if you're planting for wildlife, um, uh, what have we got? Have we got another one? No. If you're planting for wildlife, you need to be planting for um, more than birds. A lot of our little um, mammals are nectar feeders or they will live on really small uh, invertebrates and insects. And often we plant to exclude those small insects because we are planting to bring in lots of nectar feeding birds but all of our nectar feeding birds, well, I won't include lorikeets in that, but all the honey eaters, when, when, the, when the nectar stops flowing, when the blossoms aren't blossoming, they're in, insect eaters. So they're gleaning, they're looking for spiders and beetles and uh, you know, in, anything in the leaf litter. You'll see wattle birds often scrabbling about in leaf litter and whatnot. So you need to be sure that you have things that insects can eat so that you have things that the birds can eat. Otherwise, the birds will, will be there in number while you've got blossom. Uh, and then they have to go somewhere else. And then that often, if, if you haven't got the food they need on your place, they'll go somewhere else and they'll eventually die somewhere else if there isn't enough food. Or they'll drive out other birds out of good habitat. So I guess the point, uh, uh, while I'm not, I never want to discourage people from bringing birds and nature into their gardens, that's never the point. But we need to understand that if we're bringing lots of birds in and we want them to stay, or if we bring lots of birds in and they're not as part of like the blossom migrants, like the lorikeets, and some of the honey eaters following the eucalypts flowering, we need to provide for them all year round, apart from just when the, um, uh, when the, uh, when, when our favourite banksias or uh, calistamens are, are flowering or grevilleas, whatever. So, um, so we need to provide food for the things that they, they need to eat when our blossom has dried up. Does that make sense? I hope I explained that well enough. Um, that also means you need to do things like leave fallen uh, branches and, you know, you, you mentioned logs, but you also need to leave uh, parts. Bushfire is always an issue about leaving fallen timber branches on the ground, but you do need to have some areas where you do leave things like that, because you mentioned your blue tongues, but there's also much smaller lizards and they need smaller places uh, to shelter. You do need some leaf litter on the ground. Um, you do need to have things, uh, spaces where where they can get under. If you want frogs, you need to have places that they can get under and hide. And often 
often a pile of eucalypt leaves are just as uh, just as suitable as a log. Uh, depends on the uh, on the critter. Um, uh, let me see. Any uh, any questions? Uh, any more comments? I think um, I don't want to introduce too many things all all at once. Um, I will mention for people who have been with with us in the habitat gardening journey since the first episode, my my list, my handout, my my beautiful um, uh, uh, list of plant of, of flowers that are flowering by month and by colour uh, is almost ready. So I, I have been delayed with being being not too not too flash for a few weeks and. Uh, getting the new computer, all the things that conspired all at once to uh, to not go right. Uh, anyway, we're we're close with that. Uh, would someone like to leave a comment or ask a question and uh, prolong our discussion? Have you got any plants you've thought about buying or sourcing or growing, and you would like me to give a rating? Um, uh, uh, are you a skeptical? Are you a skeptical buyer when you're walking around the nursery, and uh, and seeing what what is there to offer? Um, uh, Betty, perhaps you can tell us this. What are the nurseries like in your area? Do you have to go to Goulburn, or do you have to go to Canberra, perhaps, to to find a good selection, or do you in fact have to go down to the coast, uh, places like Bournda, Bournda? Is that how you pronounce it? B O U R N D A. Fantastic nurseries down in that south coast area. Um, I'm not so sure. A little bit further north, what what's on offer? Um, let us know. I'm hoping to do a trip up there and do some filming uh, in the not too distant future. Um, head along into uh, eastern Victoria and then up the New South Wales coast, visiting uh, visiting some nurseries. Um, so, so let me know. Let me know. Um, so we'll just give it a, mi a minute or two more. Um, and if you've got a suggestion of something you would like me to talk about next, um, uh, oh, thanks, Betty. Um, I appreciate it when you say good talk. Thanks for that because. Uh, it's really difficult to do a gardening thing when you're not actually doing gardening. Um, just to let you know, because I haven't seen you in the in the audience before, um, I'm taking the camera out to some uh, what I consider really good examples of habitat in parks and in um, you know, some of the roadsides and even some suburban gardens that I've noticed. And we'll be doing some on-sites in some nurseries uh, coming up where I can do some uh, demonstration videos and posting them. At the moment, everything is going on the Bird Emergency YouTube and Facebook, but there is soon to be launched when I get a few few more of these videos done. Uh, there'll be a separate Habitat Gardening channel and nearly all of the videos will, will go on that. But anyway, that's all for a bit down the track. Um, uh, Betty, nice to nice to see you. Um, uh, oh, you got a Camden flower power. I can remember when there was only one flower power, and now there's like a chain. So that's that's cool. Um, so you're you're getting most of your plants in Sydney. So that would tend to tell me that you don't have a local, a good local retail nursery. You're probably stuck like most of us nowadays that our choice is Bunnings uh, or mail order. Actually, let uh, let me let me just ask you that. Let me just ask you that. Are are any of you using mail order plant nurseries or plant supplying services? Many of the places you see online are actually not nurseries; they just order from somewhere else and and um, uh, and uh, and will act as a middleman to get you get your stuff um, 
Uh, is that a place? Gale? Oh, no. Get, uh, is that a place? Garden Centre at, uh, at Bunnings is good. Uh, I, uh, I find it really hard to agree with, with Bunnings because their range... No, let me let me phrase it a different way. Bunnings Garden Centres are really good for what they are, but there's such a limited uh, number of uh, of plants available at any one time, which is really disheartening. So um, uh, I'm just going to have to look that up. Is G E H L? Is that a place? Uh, is that a place near you? Not that I can tell, but it is a company. It's a company of architects, apparently. Um, yeah, no, no, no. Um, uh, okay. Well, I think that's where I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to spend the rest of the day working on my uh, uh, on my leaflet so I can get these downloads ready. Ah, it's the name of a garden centre. Okay, I'm going to look that up now. So. Great betting. Let me let me let me look it up because I would love to um, love to be able to give uh, give a shout out. Oh, here we are, Gale Garden Centre, Goulburn. All right, let's have a look. Oh, looks like they got nice, uh, nicely landscaped. Um, let's give them a. So it looks like Valerie might run it. Would that be right? Um, let's bring it up. Have we got it on? We have got it on. Okay. Let's have a let's have a look. Mm, looks like nice range of plants. Certainly good plantings to see them in uh, in place. Uh, Where are they? Fitzroy, Fitzroy Street, Goulburn. Let's have a look. I always like to peep and have a look. Products and services. Let's have a look. Um, let's have a look at their outdoor plants. It looks like their their landscape supplies as well. So that's great. Um, all right, does this link go somewhere? No, oh no! Don't tell me it doesn't go anywhere. Um, got a cafe. I always like a good cafe. What's on this month? Uh, come on, no, November twenty-three. Well, they do have a calendar. All right. You know what? I might reach out to them. I reckon they could uh, do with some. Uh... Let's have a look at the cafe. I do love a cafe in a nursery. Let's have a look at the gallery for the cafe. Oh no, oh no. All right, let's um uh, Okay, they've been going 25 years. That's fantastic. Sorry, I uh, I reckon I reckon uh yeah. Let's let's go there. All right. Yeah, great coffee shop, good food and coffee. Um yeah, so many nurseries now have to run hospitality to be to be viable and if you've got a good cafe in a good nursery I reckon it could be a gold mine so um, I was just going to say Betty I, I think I might uh, I might contact them and offer to give them a hand if they're uh, if they're a good um, if they're a good native uh, if they're a good nursery that that offers a lot of um, uh a lot of ver variety in native plants and really good plants that are suitable for all the uses that the local community need. Like you need shelter browts and windbreaks. 
um, in and and they have like instead of five varieties but maybe 50 varieties that you can pick up for that kind of use um safe for browsing for livestock fire fire retardant um drought tolerant wildlife uh, wildlife attracting well then i'm all for giving them a hand so yeah um that's a good uh, that's good i'll give them i will give them a ring and um uh, and tell them that we were featuring them and that we didn't see the other site, other plants going somewhere, the other links going anywhere. Um, um, Betty, great to uh, great to meet you. Hopefully we can catch up on another um, another Saturday. Next, next week I'm back, so we can... Um, and next week we're going back to um, frogs and ponds. Uh, hopefully we'll have a guest for for next Saturday talking about frogs and ponds and um, uh, another aspect of using water uh, in your local garden and maybe I'll have one of the one of the handouts ready to go so so you can download what we what we've been talking about um, folks I'm Grant I'm a bird nerd I'm also a plant nerd um, Love to talk to you about plants and just um, share some of our experiences. Um, one one last thought. When you're walking around your garden or your property uh, this weekend, try and have a look at it through different eyes. Have a look at it for what it offers for the, um, the beetles. The centipedes, the millipedes, uh, the butterflies, the moths, uh, the little tiny, even look, aphids. Plants like aphids are great. You don't want them so much on your roses, but if there's little native uh, uh, sap sucking insects, you want them somewhere. So you just think about what your garden offers. And again, my favourite thing to think about is to think about your garden in layers, in vertical layers, and think about what uses those layers, but also up and down layers too. So columns, uh, and how easy is it for a critter to get from point, point A to point B? So just look at your garden with fresh eyes and see... Uh, what opportunities it gives you and maybe how you can uh, improve it without altering it too much. You don't want to be changing something that you've spent so much time and resources developing to fit in with your uh, lifestyle and your wants and needs. But maybe there's some tweaks you can, you can do which can uh, benefit the critters. Um, so next week, um, frogs and ponds, uh, hopefully there was something you got out of insects today. Um, let me know if you want, if, if you'd like more actual species plant selections in those sessions, or if you like the broader brush discussion, uh, happy to be led by what, what you all need. Uh, thanks again, Betty. Nice to meet you. Thanks to everyone else. Um, hopefully we will be back more in the swing and I'm feeling 100% next week, but we will be talking frogs and ponds again next week. See you, everyone.